Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker, registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders are discussed and tracked in monitored and virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading. Sales commission costs are excluded. Neither philstarworld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, agents, representatives, or independent contractors, or in such capacity, licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing in this webinar website or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options. We are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of the information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. Yay! All right, good. So what's happening? Market was diving last I looked. Holy shit! All right. <laughs> what is going on? Wow, man. <laughs> there we were having a typical uh, BS day. That was not nothing was really happening, and I was wondering why the Russell was so crazy. It was so high, and uh, down we go. I was not looking at the news. I was doing a bunch of other things, but this is fun. So let's kind of uh, find out what's going on. If anybody can tell me what's going on, that'd be really fast. But I'll look for myself. Oh. Thanks, Greg. Maybe it is. I'm just going to, uh, oh, I can't. TTS reader. Okay, hang on. Let me uh, put a bookmark up for it. TTS reader. Text to speech. It's annoying if it doesn't sound good. That looks like it though, you're right. Click play. Hang on. Click play button to listen to this text. Oh yeah. You may edit this text. That's too slow. Or upload a file such as text, PDF or ebook. There you go. How about even faster? Oh, it's hourglass. Click play button to listen to this no. text. No. You may edit this text here. Or That's upload crazy. a file such as text, PDF or ebook. All right, let's do that. And can you guys hear it? That's the question that I just realized. It doesn't matter if you can't hear it. Hang on, let's try Control C. And what to do? Okay, Control V. Now go for it. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Can you guys hear that? All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Phil Stockworld, Com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed by. All right, so can you guys hear that? Or was that just a waste of time? I stopped doing it because apparently, um, faint, but yes. Okay, I can work on that. All right, thanks, guys. Um, I stopped using it because apparently there's some kind of a feedback loopy thing in the computer, which is very clever actually, but it, it makes it so that sounds coming from the computer can't be heard by you guys. So it like, you know, cancels the noise of anything coming off the screen. Um, I, and I, I guess that's smart, but it, it didn't work out for me because that was how this thing worked. All right, good. No. Okay. And, and Clay, that's why I can't record it to an MP3. I can't, um, if I play something here, it doesn't. You guys can't hear it, unfortunately. If I just, if I normally, if I play on screen, that's if I use the mic in the computer because it's got some noise canceling feature that's kind of annoying. Uh, this mic is a separate, like a, you know, like a, like the same. Actually, it's the exact same mic that we use at the radio show. So it's a, a properly professional mic. I'm surprised how cheap they are. And um, I, I guess, frankly, though, I mean, how how old is this technology, right? Like in the 1940s. Or in 19, 1930s or whatever, when they had radio, uh, they they had um, you know, this, it's basically the same mic. It's like a very simple 
uh, electronic circuit, so not, nothing major going on here, I think. I was under the impression that the mics in the computer were great. Um, they're pretty good on my, I mean, you know, on the phone, they're pretty good. On the cameras, they're pretty good. But apparently, people were saying that's not that great. So I figured I'd just go out and get a mic for 60 bucks. Anyway, where are we? Okay, so enough of the internal affairs of putting on a podcast or whatever this thing is, a webinar. <laughs> <laughs> whatever we're doing here okay uh what happened there's the question now let's now back to the market what on earth is going on why is it down down 200 points all of a sudden um that is from last week don't care about you anymore but we would like to find out in the news news, news what is seeking alpha done with the news why is it hard to find now really Latest news. Why is a Dow down 200 points? House, House panel passes bill to decriminalize pot. All right. 24 to 10. That's pretty good. That's just a judiciary committee, though. Oh, that's great. We'll expunge prior marijuana convictions, encourage resentencing. Hearings for people under supervision, establish 5% sales tax on marijuana products. Okay, that's all reasonable. 50 co-sponsors in the House. But then it will go to the Senate to die. Although I don't know. It's, I, yeah, I think it depends on if the tobacco companies want it or don't want it. I mean, some of them are investing it. That's Mitch McConnell's territory, so we'll see what happens. Ah, here we go. <laughs> How is this something that surprises people? Stock slide on report. China deal may move to 2020. The droid says a phase one. China. No kidding. I've been saying this for a month. I've been saying, why is the market going up when this is the fact? That comes amid increasing demands from both sides, including Beijing pressing for more expensive rollbacks. Uh, da, da, da. And, and, and I'm sure that's, I'm sure the story that broke the camel's back was last night when the, um, when the uh, when the when Congress, both houses, in fact, actually did something together and they and they both agreed to sanction China over Hong Kong. I mean, that's just really pisses China off. So here's that. You know, if if somebody's shaking your hand like that, just get away from them. It's not good. That's like that is super creepy. Um, Five weeks, just over five weeks, da, da, da. <laughs> Every month they say, might, might do it, won't do it, will do it. Violent crackdown. Okay. The Senate passed a bill Tuesday condemning the crackdown and pledging support for Hong Kong, which was immediately criticized by Beijing. The violent crackdown, blah, blah, blah. Is he really going to be voted for a gripping grin? Okay, who cares? Negotiations are complicated by conflicts. China's going to make a deal that I like, said Trump. Yeah, sure they are. The flare of intentions between Washington and Beijing. Um, okay, yeah. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> didn't, wait, wait, wait. When, when, did, when did Kudlow say everything was about to be signed? What was that? Uh, let's see. You know, I don't, I don't like to say somebody's a liar, but, you know. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Oh, no, that must have been all the way until last week. There it is. Cudlow. Anyways, my whole article Friday was like, hey, you can't believe him. You can't believe the state. I just got off on tangents. I was like, this is, come on, people. Seriously, how can you possibly believe this man? That's what he was hired to lie to you. That was his whole job is to lie to you. Trump picked him. Because he has absolutely no compunction at all about lying. He's a drug. This guy's a drug addict. He's a coke fiend. Um, he totally crashed out like in the in the eighties or nineties, and uh, you know he had been Reagan's economic an economic guy for Reagan. Then he then he got crazy and he got on TV and he started doing drugs and <laughs> now he's like rehabilitated, but he's rehabilitated as a you know as a, as a guy who'll just do whatever you tell him to do, basically. Ugh, he's a horrible person. Anyway, <laughs> it's like, why anybody would believe a word this guy says? 
So, you know, I, I've been incredulous of the rally. And if you tell me it's going to go down, I'm like, oh, okay, good. That's about right. So there you go. There's everything lost. When was Friday? Friday was way up here. Look at that. Wait, no, that's today. 17, 15th. Friday was the 15th. So here we go. We we're right back to where we were before Cudlow said that the deal was good. So this has all been pretty much a waste of time. Um, you know, look, unfortunately, the market's been going up so much, we started buying some stocks. And that's why I just said yesterday, though, I don't believe in what we're doing. I don't believe that we should be putting a lot of money into the market. And um, I've been pretty conservative with our picks, but I bet we're going to get banged on it. Um, this is not updated, so i got to refresh this page. Portfolios. And Boca's down 2.5%. Now, I, I didn't put it in the new trades yet, so I have to wait. Uh, Butterfly, 110%. That's about normal-ish for them. Um, dividends, no, 1.4%, so boring. Earnings, 4%, boring. Short-term, 46.5. All right. Holding up well. All right. So no damage. I mean, you know, it shouldn't be any damage. We're back to where we were last week. And I was pleased with where we were last week. And uh, it's the same. Um, we'll have to see how much damage this really does because, oh, I mean, look, there wasn't going to be a trade deal. That wasn't a thing. And I guess they thought there was going to be one by December 15th. And now there's not until January 15th. So what's a a month of more to no trade deals really worth. This could go either way. So meanwhile, what are we going to do? We just pick up some stocks that we like, and it's still the same strategy. We're going for value. And that is what I was talking about today in the post. I talked about value in an odd sort of way, but I was just basically saying like, look, because mm, here's the problem I have when I'm trying to explain value because people say what about this method and what about that method and what about this and how about that and what if this and that there's there's always going to be factors and you've got to realize that even that but to me there is there's an underlying fact value is a fact there's a number that i look at when i pick a stock and, I, and my valuation method doesn't have to be correct in fact i, I frankly I used to be an M&A consultant, so I would go in there, I would examine companies, and I would decide how much we'd be willing to pay for it. And I do tend to move towards cash flow and earnings because when I look at a company, I think of myself as a company acquiring it, and I think about what I would pay to acquire that company. Um, it's not that different, or it shouldn't be that different when you're investing, though. To me, in my opinion, you know, this is my fundamental approach to things. Um, I'm buying something to put my money to work. I have money. My money's in the bank and my money's getting, uh, well, in this in this environment, no interest, but let's say in theory, assuming it's in a 10-year bond and I wasn't going to do anything with it, my money's getting two-year interest, 2% 2 interest. So if I do nothing, I get 2% interest. And it can't be taken away from me. It's all safe, whatever. So, or... I can try to make 4% or 5% or 6% or whatever playing in the market. But now I have a risk because now I could lose some. And if I'm a 2% investor, so let's say I have $10 million and I get $200,000 a year in interest and I live off my $200,000 a year in interest. And I said, next year, I'll still have 2 million. Next year, I'll still have 10 million. Next year, I'll still have 10 million. I'll always have $10 million and I'll always get 200,000 a year. Fine. On the other hand though, let's say I have $10 million and I spend $300,000 and I get 200,000 in interest. Now I'm $100,000 in the hole every year. And that means in 10 years, I'll only have $9 million. And obviously that'll change every every year it changes, but over time, that means two years from, 10 years from now, I will, I will still want $300,000, but I've only got $180,000 coming in. So now I have to take 120 off the top every year. And at the end of 10 years, I'm going to have 1.2 million less than 9 million, which is $7.8 million. 
all of a sudden my fortune is dwindling away. <clears throat> and believe me, I know you're like, oh, you know, you'll still live out your life and never have to, you know, worry again. Fine. But that's not how people who have money think. It's you think if as soon as it starts dwindling, as soon as that those numbers, as soon as you have less money than you had last year, it starts to bother you. And it should bother you because that means you're not saving, you're overspending. I mean, it should bother you no matter what kind of status you have in life. Um, well, okay, except if you're a billionaire, in which case you shouldn't worry about you being an idiot for worrying about it. Um, and you're damaging everybody else. That's the Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders problem with billionaires is because we should act like that because we are effectively poor and we want to save our money for retirement. So we want to have enough money to retire and live 40 years without touching our money or without losing too much of it so that we can leave money to our kids and so on and so forth. Um, whereas while that is good for us to do, normal human beings, when someone becomes a billionaire, they started out as a normal human being, um, mostly. And the problem is, so they still have that. In fact, they're one of the reasons they become a billionaire is because they have that attitude of I want more next year and build and build and build um, rather than spend. They're not out there spending. You know, most billionaires aren't out there partying like Richard Branson. Uh, <laughs> you guys, the guy's like on a nonstop uh, fun tour. Um, but most billionaires are working. You know, I mean, the, 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 you know, not most. I mean, it's plenty. The, the ones you hear about, anyway, the ones you know who are public are generally workers because um, they like being rich. They like making money. That's the fun part. You know, it's not, it's not fun. There's just so many parties you can go to, you know? It really is. I mean, on, honestly, I've, I've actually, I mean, I guess probably because I don't really like new music that much, but I mean, I, I've burned out on concerts. And I thought I thought I would always go to concerts. I thought when I, you know when I lived up in New York, I thought I would never get tired of going going to the concerts and uh, watching bands. But the bands just got older and older, and I'd seen them five times and whatever. And I, I wasn't going to get better seats. I already got the best seats in the house when I felt like it. Um, that gets boring. A lot of stuff gets boring, you know. So it's like it, you know, at a certain point in the in the money cycle it's just that those things like this the lifestyle stuff is gets kind of dull and, and it's more interesting to get out there and just make some more money build another company do something else problem is though when billionaires try to get richer you know they they make hundreds of millions of dollars and if they make hundreds of millions of dollars that's that's hundreds of people who don't get to make a million dollars because it is a competition there is a finite amount of money in the world and there is a competition to get that money and if the if a, if Jeff Bezos gets thirty billion dollars richer, that means uh, that means three thousand people didn't um, didn't get to be millionaires, or thirty thousand people didn't get to be millionaires because Jeff Bezos took the money. Um, and what's he really doing with it? Nothing. He starts another company, makes makes another thirty billion dollars. And yes, he drags some people along with him when he does that, but it's nothing compared to what would what the benefit would be if if. You let 30,000 other people have a chance to, to make money. Um, anyway, so where the hell was I? <laughs> so I used to be an M&A consultant. I look at things in the terms of buying the whole company. And, and like I said, rich people have a different attitude. That's right. That's what I was going to say. So if, when you're rich and you have stock and whatever, you still want to make the money. You don't want to not make the money because you have $100 million. You still want to make $10 million this year. So you look for things that give you a good return, but it's a little bit different because your your focus tends to shift a bit more from uh, building to protecting. You know, once people cross a certain threshold and they have enough money to live comfortably the rest of their lives, they might want to uh, make sure their children are going to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. But the motivation tends to dwindle at a certain point. There's not that many people who are that driven to go past that mark. You know, once you're really set financially, I mean, over $10 million, most people at that point will tend to turn more inward and be very safe with their investments and just sit on what they have. You know, they don't tend to like go out and risk half their money on some scheme to like hopefully double up again. Um, that takes an aggressive person with an aggressive nature who's not satisfied with $10 million. Um, so, and, and there are people who just like it for the game. And I'm one of those people. I just like the game. I like to make money. I like building companies, I like doing stuff that's fun for me. 
I frankly, it's, frankly, it's the most fun for me. I should, I, I should have more of a uh, rounded thing. I mean, I, I like doing lots of things, but I love, you know, making money. I love doing, building companies, doing things. And I, I and I, and I say, yeah, I love, I love it because I can employ people. I love it because I love giving people jobs. It's my favorite thing in the world. But I mean, I love just the whole getting out there, building a business, turning it into something, making money. That's just way too much fun for me. I would never give that up. Um, doesn't matter how much money I have. So I, I have that kind of drive in me also for that to, to just keep making money. Um, but I, but I notice most people don't. I, I live in Florida now. I live with, I live with, with a million people who don't. They, they retired and they quit and they sat in the, and they sit in the sun. And a lot of them have tons of money, but they don't do anything with it. But anyway, so there's those kind of investors who are, you know, most people in Florida are the coupon clipping type. They're the ones that did stop at a certain point in their lives, said they're going to quit, go to Florida, play golf, and that's that. They're not really going for action down here. Um, then there's uh, the other kind, you know, then, the, the, then there's the older people, like the Wall Street's full of the old people who still work, into, you know, because they enjoy, just enjoy the work. That's a different kind of crowd. Then there are entrepreneurs. There's lots of those who run companies and don't want to give up their companies and like what they're doing. That's great. But everyone's got a different attitude playing the market. And you have to be aware of that. So you look at something that's a certain way, a company that's a certain way, and it serves a certain purpose for you, like a dividend stock, like here. Like here's our dividend portfolio. So I, 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 mean, I haven't checked every single company, but as far as I know, nobody's paid us any dividends yet. We've only had the portfolio open since uh, uh, for, for not even a month. So ba I basically, well, we, we started 1025. So yeah, a little less than a month. So maybe somebody paid a dividend, but I certainly didn't record it yet. Um, so we have this dividend portfolio. It's only, it's right now only up 0.4%. It was up a bit more, but whatever happened. Um, how much are we down now? 235. But the point of this portfolio is to, is to pay dividends. And actually, when we do a review, I'm going to say, uh, go through one of those reviews where I say exactly how much money we expect every single one to make. And I, what I want to do is basically try not to touch it at all and see how close we come to hitting our target without touching the portfolio. Because it's a fact. In every single one of these positions, we expect it to make a certain amount of money. Now, Due to the increase in the VIX, we notice we sell, we, we're selling tons of puts and calls. Also, every one of these positions has short puts and calls. So the rising VIX, da, 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 da. well, there we go. Oh, look at that. Wow. So the rise is hourly. Let's see. Wow. <laughs> so the rising VIX is your clue that, um, how's it look over here? VIX, VIX, VIX. Don't have a VIX. Oh, well. Anyway, the rising VIX is your clue that your portfolio is going to get damaged if you sell a lot of premium. In reality, though, I very much doubt these are far off the mark. We have China Telecom. We bought it for uh, 39. It is now 39.28. We are right on track. Obviously, we only did this like days ago. Pfizer is over 35. Energy transfer is over, no, it's not. It's $12 call, it's $11.28. Ford is a $7 call, $8.70, way in the money. Macy's $15 call at the money. Altria, $47.50, over the money. Annaly, $7 call, over the money. Signet, $13 call, over the money. Tangiers is a $15 call, over the money. And at t is a $35 call over the money. So every single one of these is on track, and we're not playing them to make gains in the stock. We're only playing them to collect the dividends. So the only problem in the dividend portfolio is that they don't pay the dividend. That happens. It's a problem. But we don't really – the day-to-day -day fluctuations of the stock don't matter. So that's a great portfolio. And these are – I imagine that the aggregate of this portfolio is probably going to make roughly uh, like 32% over two years. So 16% a year roughly is going to be the number we're going to hit, maybe a bit higher, maybe 17 and a half, something like that. But that's all this portfolio is supposed to do. It's safe, it's conservative, and, it's, and, and we have the backup of getting the dividends. 
but we've already basically filled it up. We use we have negative 16 in cash. We have very little margin required from the positions we have, but um, this assumes 100,000 in buying power, so we'd be minus 33. But if you have a, a two if you have a 2x margin account, you'd have a uh, seven uh, 70,000 left, 67,000 left. So that's where we are. So we really can't touch this portfolio. So I mean, it'll be interesting to just like lay it out and see how much we're supposed to make, see how close we come to making it. And that, look, that serves a fantastic purpose. And I've done this before and I'll do it again, because if you go and, and look up a compound rate calculator, and you say to yourself, okay, so if I start with $100,000, Oh, 10,000. If I start with $100,000 and I go for 30 years from now and I make 17% a year and I reinvest that money, obviously, that's why it's compound, I'm going to get $11 million in 30 years. That's pretty good. Okay. In 20 years, only 2.3 million. Still not bad though. But think about that in 20 years. <clears throat> actually, it is that bad. Isn't that weird? How is that right? Seems very odd. Well, it is what it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of like adding a hundred thousand a year. You're not adding a hundred thousand a year. You're only starting with a hundred thousand. That's why. If you start with a hundred thousand, that's fair. Then in twenty years, you get two point three million dollars. But why would you do that? Because if you wait 10 more years, <laughs> you're going to get $11 million. So, and, and this is this is also part of your planning. You should always be playing with these things. It's always important to play with this and think about your retirements because that's why, why should you stop working? Why would you want to start touching the money when it's only $2 million? And let's say you're 65 or something, you think you've hit your goal and you're happy. I'm like, just work 10 more years, man. Your thing will, the thing will gain a million while you're out making uh, 50, 75,000, whatever the hell you're making at some job to like just, you know, not tap into that money. You, you're going to sock away another million dollars a year practically. Why would you not do that? It doesn't make sense not to do that. Let it run. So, the, but the point is that, of course, <clears throat> And this works fine. And let's say that there are um, five of these years in 30 that you break even. And you don't make 17%, but you break even. So then you're at $5 million. Let's say we only get 13% back. Now you're back at 2 million bucks. That's still 30 years. It's the same 30 years, but a little bit less successful. 13% return. And five of the years you don't make any money, fine. Now, the real trick is don't lose money because if you lose 25% one year, then you've wiped out two years of returns. And that's why these good, safe portfolio strategies are, are great because they're fairly reliable and you're very likely to, to make money all 30 years. And maybe you don't make 17%, but at least if you make 13%, you'll have 4 million bucks. And that's just starting with $100,000. And not putting anything in. Oh, watch this. This is the coolest thing. Let's say you put in ten thousand more dollars a year. So three point nine goes to what? Wait. Oh, that's ten dollars. <laughs> I'm like, what? One, two, three. That was a ripoff. Three point nine goes to seven point two. <clears throat> so just putting in another three hundred thousand dollars adds three million dollars to your total. That's pretty interesting, right? And again, that's the problem. People have these accounts and they have you have your stock account and you invested, you know, half or you put a half a million in an account a couple of years ago and you're letting it run and it's doing great. And so you don't worry about it. And meanwhile, you're going out and saying, well, my stock account's doing great. So therefore I can buy the, I'll buy the Porsche and I'll do this and I'll do that. You know, and meanwhile, or, or this, uh, what, what was that thing I just put up? I forgot there was something that was like really expensive that was really cool. Um, I just posted it because it was just so cool. Um, anyways, you know, like you blow a 40,000 bucks on a thing. We have a travel agency now and people spend $200,000 on a vacation. Um, 
that's all lovely, but you know what? If you took the freaking money and you put it into your account and added it and increased the buying power of your stocks, you would get that money back in, in, in triple, quadruples, 10 times when you're older and you probably are gonna want it more. You know, don't don't let your don't do what they call lifestyle creep. Lifestyle creep means that you're just every time you get more money, you raise your lifestyle. <clears throat> so you're you're basically not really gaining anything. You just get you know you're making more money, but you're spending more money. And every time you make more money, you spend more money, and you never actually improve. You never like build the retirement. You end up just building your lifestyle, and that then means by the time you retire, you're gonna have this ridiculous lifestyle that you can't possibly sustain. And I would say. Mm, Probably about 40% of the people in Florida fit that category. I mean, the, these people are buying homes. They are 50 years old, successful people. And um, my brother's girlfriend, uh, she sells these luxury homes. So I see it all the time. So they're successful people. They are in their 50s generally, you know, like young retirees. And or they're not even really retired. They're buying a second home in Florida and going back and forth because they like Florida and they want to start building a home. I understand where you want to do that, but it's a huge expense for not particularly any good reason. It's like if you just put the money, like like right there, if you just put ten thousand in the bank. Here, let's take away the ten. If we take away the ten, okay, our base goes back to three point nine million. Now. If you just do that for 10 years and add, well, I'm sorry, 10 years is gonna give us a different result. 10 years is uh, 339. Now, let's say we put away $10,000 more a year for 10 years, 547. All right, so that's uh, 349, 200,000 more. So by putting away 100,000, you're adding 200,000 more to what you're gonna have in your retirement account in just 10 years. So in the 10 years that you were maintaining two homes in Florida, if instead you took that money that you're paying for a mortgage and whatever, and it's going to be a lot more than $10,000, and you put it into your retirement account, you could basically 10 years from now just buy the home for cash. Just go stay in a freaking hotel when you want to come down to Florida. You don't need to have a home in Florida if you live in New York. It's not necessary. And, I, and again, I'm not talking to the people who have so much money they don't know what to do with it. I'm talking to the people who have a, a normal amount of money, like a few, a million, and that's I know that's not normal to some of you, but like, you, if people have a half a million dollars to, in their retirement fund or two million or even five million in your retirement fund, you're just not that rich. Don't blow all your money. You know, put money aside for retirement. Keep putting money aside for retirement. Make it bigger and bigger because you never know. You never know what you're going to want. And maybe some opportunity will come up and you'll say, oh, my God, I have all this money in this account. I get to, I can actually take advantage of some opportunity that comes along. Um, anyway, so that's that. Very important point, though. Let's see if anybody's got any comments. Nope, nobody has anything to say. Great. Okay. So what else are we talking about? So I'm saying, look, you can look at the same company the same way. That's what I was getting to in the point here. You can look at companies the same way, value them the same way, and still come out with different opinions. And that's really where the political discourse goes to. There's there are facts. They're, you know, they're on TV right now, Congress doing the fact checks on everything and writing it down, getting testimony, saying this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Those are facts. At a certain point, you have to all agree that like this actually did happen, and he actually did say this and that because three people said so, and and no, and the, and the the people who said that that's not true sound like they're completely full of crap. At a certain point, you arrive at a conclusion and say there's the fact of the matter. That's what happened. That's what they say in court. The fact of the matter. Um, it's the same thing with a company with earnings. You know, you look at earnings; they have different statements, different ways to look at, it, and so on and so forth. But eventually, there's a valuation there. And those valuations are different to different people. Even though there's an actual valuation, there's still your opinion of a valuation. There's still you saying, um, what's it worth to you? How do you view it? 
And you may not be looking for the same kind of investment. You may not want a dividend investment that's only going to pay you uh, 1% per month. Not that it's, and, and I know it's weird because it's like 1% a month is a lot of money. But, you know, we're not happy with it because we have a butterfly portfolio. And that's up 106%. It was up 110% five minutes ago. Um, and that's from two years ago. 18, 19, yeah. So that's two years old, and it's made it's made 50-something percent a year. We have a earnings portfolio that's not doing good at the moment, I don't think. 3.6%. Well, it's up 3.6% in a month. I mean, but again, that's it's boring. for it, It's not that exciting seeming now. But that's because also it compounds. Because watch, if we made 3.6% every month, And this is why I take this with a grain of salt, by the way, because if you you think it's nothing, but we start with $100,000, we're not adding anything to it. We give it 12 months to grow instead for 10 months, and we say 3.6% per month. That's that's $152,000. So we'll be up 52% by the end of the year. That's pretty damn good. You know, so if you make 3.6% a month, you should be thrilled. But it just seems boring while it's while you're making the 3.6% a month. You go, oh, is that all $3,000, all, all this work? And we made $3,603? That's the problem with compounding. You don't realize how powerful it becomes if you just let it keep going. And it, and it becomes like very tedious for people to do it. Um, earnings, Hamboka is probably lost still. Oh, yeah, 3.4. I still didn't put it in the new trades, but I don't think it's going to change that much because they're brand new. So minus 3.4% on hemp boca. Most look at this one. CMJ has cost us 9,000 bucks. That's painful. And we got the short-term portfolio. And that's up 46%. That's all. That's two months. So that's, that's getting 20%. So let's see, 23% a month, $100,000, 23% a month. Now we're talking money for a year. $1.2 million. So if we do this every month, if we keep up this pace, we'll have $1.2 million at the end of the year. Isn't that fun? Obviously, it's ridiculous. And that goes back to why we cashed out our other portfolios, because we, you know, we were up some crazy amounts in the long-term portfolio and the short-term portfolio. And um, I know the money, I know for a fact, I can't remember the exact amount, so the money to our portfolio was up 148% in two years. And that's not normal. And in the same way as if something can be too low, things can be too high. And it was too high. And I just didn't feel comfortable keeping it open. So we scrapped out and went to cash. And that was back in late September. And it was obviously too early. I was, I mean, I'm not even going to say maybe too early. It was obviously too early now because uh, look where we are. But, you know, it was too early in 1999 too. We're cashing out because the market went went up another 100 percent in 1999. After a huge decade in 1999, the market went up another freaking 100 percent after being up two or three hundred percent in the decade, and it just never stops. And it's, it's kind it's possible we could have something like that happen now, um, but then a year later, it was half of where it was. So. You, you you know you can look at it and say oh we got out too early we missed a hundred percent rally but would you have actually gotten out at the hundred percent rally or would you have ended up getting screwed like everybody else did when it crashed? Um, wow, look that's dramatic, isn't it? Look at that. So at the end of September we were up here three oh two one, and now we're at three oh nine six. It feels like we missed something because we missed the drop. We cashed out around here. We missed this drop, and uh, maybe that's us cashing out. <laughs> but we know we cashed out way before that happened. But we cashed out in September. Then the then the market dropped, and we felt very clever. But since then, we felt unclever because it's gone up and up and up and up and up. And that's the 200-day moving average, not the 50-day moving average. Here's September. Well, actually, it's really October by the time it was down. So, you know, had we jumped back in with both feet and bought here, then great. But I I thought we were going to range in here and then go down further. We didn't. We went way up. But why did we go way up? We went up because of the China deal. We went up because Brexit is better, which it really isn't at the moment. 
Um, we went up because um, uh, because the impeachment doesn't seem to matter to anybody. Because they, you know, we're, we're in an impeachment now. There's hearings going on right now. Uh, these are the impeachment hearings. T Trump will be asked to either testify or submit written responses. Nixon didn't go under the uh, under the thing. They didn't actually sit there and put Nixon on the stand. He made a lot of statements, um, and his lawyers said a lot of things. But Rick, Nick, Richard Nixon never took the stand. Um, Clinton took the stand very famously, but Clinton was a uh, a lawyer, and Clinton felt like he could handle it. He was like, oh, I can do this. Now Nixon was a lawyer too, actually, but not the same kind. Of, he wasn't. He was. He wasn't as good a lawyer as, as a Clinton was. Um, so Clinton was very, very confident that he could uh, sit there and deal with the testimony, and he was, I mean, especially when he said, um, that depends on what your uh, definition of the word is, is. <laughs> That's really breaking down somebody's uh, questioning, right? It's like, uh, what do you mean by is? <laughs> And uh, that's, uh, and the, I mean, I, it's still to this day, I can't, I, it's hard to get over that he was really impeached over a single lie that he told. It wasn't even because he had sex in the White House with a with an intern, he was being impeached, which, which now would be a big deal because people think that's wrong. Um, you know, but uh, the Me Too stuff, it'd be like, oh my God, and like that's the worst part. <laughs> no, the worst part was that he lied to Congress when they asked him um whether or not he had sex with her and he said no i did not and they proved that he did and therefore he lied to congress and my god what could be worse than that right um so for that they had the entire impeachment hearings that dragged on and on and on forever this is not that at all <laughs> and you think it would affect the market but so far it hasn't so far everybody acts like it's nothing but the more and more evidence amounts against trump the, it gets a little off kilter. And then, of course, things like this China thing happen where they, they're not, um, they don't have to help him. They don't have to do anything for him. They don't have to make a trade deal. They don't have to make him look good. And he better be kissing their ass because he wants a trade deal. They're going to want a lot from him. And then Congress turns around. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have control over that Trump. But Congress turns around and sanctions China. For over the Hong Kong thing, that's not good. That pisses them off. And so, you know, we could see this coming a mile away. But, but you know, I've been saying all month, though, that there's no trade deal. There isn't really a trade deal. It's just people telling you there's a trade deal. And how many times can you, can you fool people? And apparently the answer is a lot. Over and over again, the same thing. It's going to be a deal. We're coming close. Everything looks great. And then all of a sudden it's not. And nobody gets held accountable. What ever happened to accountability? Like, why does Larry Kudlow get to go on TV and make statements like that when he's lied over and over and over again? Why does Trump get to do it? Why does Trump get to stand in front of a helicopter lying for 15, 20 minutes with cameras on him where not one thing he says is true? And they cover it like they cover it without comment. They just let him talk and put it on television. Maybe afterwards the commenters will come on, but you know the damage is already done. People are. Uh, that's another thing I noticed in Florida, and I guess this is probably true. I'm I'm from New York, and New York it's different because if you have a TV on, people usually will put the volume on or something like that in a bar or something. Um, in in Florida, nobody has the volume on. It's the only way you know what's going on is by looking at those headlines, and that's why I understand now what Fox does because they put those big giant headlines underneath people. Doesn't matter what they're actually saying. Or what's going on? Whatever their headline is, is what the impression people get. They're like, "Oh, look, they're showing it on TV, and that must be true." Because they, why would they put a headline under it if it wasn't true? If it wasn't, if it wasn't representing what they were saying? But no, that's not. That, now I understand what Fox does because it doesn't matter that your headline is completely not what you're watching. Because I watch Fox, you know, I watch Fox at home, and I go, "How is it that they have a headline?" of a guy testifying and what the guy is saying in the testimony has nothing to do with what the headline says he said. And I understand now that that's, that that's how the game works because you've got these huge amounts of people who are, who watch TVs through windows, who watch TVs in bars, who watch TVs passing by, and they're, they're just watching the screen. They don't 
for whatever reason, care what's actually being said. It's so funny. They just look for these big headlines on things. I find that interesting. It just it bothers me because I like to actually know what's going on. It's like I'll, I'll sit there and pause and rewind to find out what somebody actually said. But, um, you know, I, I don't take for granted. Well, I guess I don't take for granted what they write on the screen. I want to hear what the person actually did say. And these these testimonies are crazy because, God, I mean, people people say something clearly indicting Trump and being like completely against what the president said. And you'll see Fox News being like, aha, see, <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? Aha? It's crazy. Anyway, so it's a warped perception. No matter what the reality is, there are ways that it can be spun and perceived in different ways. So you have to understand that. And even very intelligent people can look at two different things two totally different ways and it doesn't make it doesn't make either one of them wrong but i hate to say that because it kind of clouds the issue it doesn't make them wrong that they have two different views of what something is but they're wrong in that they're both they both need to dig deeper and find the actual truth and they both have to be willing to find the truth and that's what I look for in valuations. I look for the truth in evaluation. And so what we looked in in Home Depot here and Lowe's, so what caught my eye this morning was Home Depot. I don't know where they are now. Oh, now they're way down. Home Depot. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was Lowe's. Lowe's is, Lowe's is back down. Lowe's was popping 5%. And I was like, why are they popping 5%? Mostly they're popping 5% because yesterday they went down. So it wouldn't it would have been a two, three percent rally, but instead it looked like a five percent rally. And why did it look like a five percent rally? Because they people were relieved because yesterday when Home Depot did this, Lowe's did that, and they both sold off. So people were worried Lowe's was going to be as bad as Home Depot. And frankly, Home Depot wasn't bad. That was a weird thing about it. Um so in the end, I said, look, the, what the reality though is is that. Um, Home Depot got super overvalued. Lowe's wasn't quite as overvalued. And, you know, given uh, using a PE ratio, they're both coming into the same sort of 21 ish uh, PE ratio. So they're both, their, their PEs are merging. One was too, Lowe's was too low and Home Depot was too high. And now they are coming back together and they're going to meet in the middle and they were going to be happy. So Home Depot is going to be happy up here at 220. And Lowe's will be happy right about here at like 115, 120 range, like around there. And and they're a little bit unique. They're like Coke and Pepsi. It's like they're basically the same thing. Lowe's and Home Depot have very, they are, you know, they're both obviously the hardware type superstores. Uh, they, they, they're in the same marketplaces. They work under the same conditions. They buy from the same people. So it, it would be very unusual for one to be valued very differently than the other one. And it, But an exercise like this, like studying these two stores and how they're valued, makes it interesting because it can teach you a lot about valuation by following two companies that are almost indistinguishable from each other. That's one good way to learn how to value something. Okay, it's like having a male and a female cadaver, right? You look at the differences by looking for the differences between the male and female cadaver and how they and how they respond to, and how the or or live men and women, whatever, and how they respond to different things. That's how you learn something. You say, oh, that doesn't do the same thing there, and that's not the same there. But on the whole, they're both extremely similar. You know, where whereas like an alien looking at a man and a woman would probably basically not really be able to tell them apart because like well they both have two this and two that and they're all pretty much the same except for this one thing, you know that's there's barely a difference. So you learn more by the comparison and by looking at a couple of similar things rather than two totally different things because how do you know there's too many factors that can be different and it doesn't teach you anything. But here. So many things are the same that any kind of difference and how the market reacts to that difference is what really what really can set off legs and stand out. So if you want to learn good valuation, this is not a bad model to find. Then I uh, use this AI engine, uh, Wolfram Alpha. It's kind of cool. Um, you can ask it anything and it runs it through an AI system. 
and it tries to answer it. So in this case, I just wrote PE of HD. And it, I, I only thought it would tell me the PE of HD. I, was, I actually wanted to know the history. But I started off saying, can you even tell me the PE of HD? I don't know what it knows and what it doesn't know. Um, and it apparently looks at Morningstar and it says, well, the PE is 2238. And then it decides, which is very interesting, it decided on its own without me telling it that I might want to see a history calendar, the PE of HD, which is exactly what I wanted. So, so cheers for AI, right? I actually got exactly what I wanted. So we look at the PE of HD and we see it's, it really is kind of right where it usually is. But that, you know, from a, from a market perspective, though, <clears throat> I don't want to buy it right where it usually is. Half the time it's higher and half the time it's lower. So why would I want to buy it when it's higher? I only, I only want to buy when it's low. And how, how often is it low? It was low last year. And it was low in 2016. What if we can do 10 years? So using this line, which is 20. Okay, so the PE was 20 or less last year. Well, actually earlier. Yeah, well, last year, sorry. Last year, the year before, the year before that, the year before that, and the year before that. Well, every single year, Home Depot drops to a PE below 20. Why would I buy it above 20? Okay, and especially knowing that 20 is a pretty high PE and it's higher than the S&P. It makes no sense for me to buy it if it, if it does go below 20. It's not like uh, Netflix or something like that. It does go below 20, therefore I should buy it below 20. I should wait. And if it's not below 20 now, if it's like this, and I go, don't wait. And this is what happens to you. They go, oh, 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 no. Oh, no, I missed it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, I missed it. And then six months later, boom. If you missed it, you missed it. Go find another stock to trade. But don't pay extra chasing things. That's stupid. Um, P.E. of Netflix. Oh. And people just sit here and ask this thing endless questions. I don't, I never use it really. So it's just occurred to me that if I want to find the PE, that might be a good place to look. Um, Cause it's obscure. It's good for finding obscure stuff. Um, Netflix, PE is always over a hundred, but it is sometimes below a hundred. Right now it's below a hundred, but it's below a hundred last year. It never was below a hundred here, but then 2015. So out of three, out of five years, three years, it was below a hundred. And 100 is ridiculous, of course. Um, the more the more Netflix uh, becomes a production company, the, the lower the PE multiple should be. Look at the maximum fee, 405. 405 times earnings. That's crazy. That is really, really crazy. And, and notice that if they were at 405 times earnings here, now they're a hundred times earnings here. Still a hundred though, and still crazy. Let's see, related queries. I'm interested in this. What do you got? Price to book tangible book ratio. Top 10 financial entities by PE ratio. Okay, tell me. Okay. Find and analyze current data about a stock. Whoa. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, boring. That's not good. Oh, these are cute, though. Histograms. Yeah, it's interesting. Just get a different view of things. This is, this is what the computer decides is interesting about a stock. I don't know if I agree. But it is kind of cool. <laughs> it is kind of build an AI and put it up on the web for free. Why not, right? Anyway, so the point is fundamentally, in my opinion, there is an actual value to to um, to, a, to a stock like HD or Home Depot or Lowe's. But that also then depends on the needs of the buyer. 
Okay, so if a company really needs it, if it's a strategic buyer and it makes a fit and it completes something they want to do and adds to their plan, it's worth more to them than it is to you who's simply deciding, well, what am I going to do with my million dollars? Should I invest it in this one or this one or this one? Then you want to give the one that gives, gives you the best return. And of course, your, your time frame for your strategies matters. You may be day trading, you have a different set of circumstances there. You may be a long-term investor, you may be a short-term investor, mid-range. Depending on that too, depends on what kind of stocks you wanna be investing in. You have to decide all the time. We have the, not that it's doing well at the moment, but we honestly, the, the earnings portfolio rate is, has not been great. I mean, it's up 4%. And well, like I said, it's up 4% a month, which is not bad, but you know, really, I, I just, it could be doing better. How bad, what's wrong? Um, iRobot is, I don't know, actually, I don't know, is it, is it, did it lose ground? Where's my pictures? Chart, oh, there you go. IRBT. Oh yes, I, I robot. We 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 only picked up around here, but it's, I robot's been flat. We think it's going to go up. Uh, IMAX also flattish, but it's you know our, our goal is twenty two. It's at twenty one sixty six, so it's fine. Uh, Cleveland Cliff not really taking off yet, but it's still halfway to our goal, so we're fine. Especially with seven dollar puts. Boeing. I, I, I mean, it's made three thousand bucks. You can't say it's terrible, but it's not not exciting. But all of these are winners. Every single one's a winner. I don't know. It's just I. It's just, it's just not enough to make me excited. That's the problem with these kind of portfolios. Um, but still, four percent a month. That's I mean, what are you what are you going to make? And, and at the end of the year, I'll be very proud if it's up fifty percent. Frankly, it just it just I hate when you start the portfolio with this tedious, you know, grinding out just to make a few percent. It's much more exciting later when we have a lot more money to throw around. But you got to start somewhere, right? And that's the thing, you've got to have your goals. And as it's, it's hard as it is for me to make conservative plays and, and use only, uh, tw not even, I mean, don't forget it's half our buying power. So we, you know, we're using like 10%, 12% of our buying power. Uh, that's, it's against my nature, but on the other hand, it's, it's what's right for this portfolio. You have to take that into account. It's what's appropriate. And and you have to you have to look at what's appropriate for your own investing and what's going to get you to where you want to go over time. And, and also, by the way, you can't just say what's appropriate for your investing. But I, I wanted to make that really clear too. If you, <laughs> I was just talking to a kid. Oh, at the radio at the radio show, the kid goes to me. We you know he was talking to me a couple of weeks ago about the market, and he wanted to invest. And he said, oh, you know, I think I'll put a few thousand dollars into something. I'm like, oh, that's great. I said, you could open up a thing at Robin Hood and start there. So then um, yesterday he goes to me, he says, he goes, well, what do you think the best stock is if you only have $500? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, $500? I said, what well, happened to thousands of dollars? He goes, oh, no, well, something came up and he bought something. So he bought, he had this money. He was going to invest it. And he, you know, he's in his 20s, but I mean, he was going to invest it, but he decided instead to buy something and just invest 500 And now he's, but now he realizes that was kind of a mistake. And he wants to say, how could I make my 500 turn into 1000 or $2,000 as quickly as possible? And I'm like, it's just, it's inappropriate for, for your lifestyle. You can't do that. You can't just flip a coin and put it on all or nothing bets just because you were inadequate in your savings. It's not up to the market to make it up to you. The market's going to do what it's going to do. The market's going to return. If you bet, if you play SPY straight up for 20 years, you're going to make 8% basically. That's roughly the historical return on, on the S&P. Um, Unfortunately, though, there are many 20 and 40% corrections in the SPY over the last, any over any period you look at, let's say since 87 was the SNL crisis, and that's 30 years ago. So in 30 years, you had 40, 50% corrections from the SNL crisis, you had the dot-com bust, and you have the other one. So in 10, every 10 years, there's been a 40% correction in the S&P, and... 
constantly, 20% corrections happen all the time. So if you're only making 8% a year and you happen to get caught up at any point almost in a 40% correction, you're going to have a lot of, a lot of years digging yourself back out of the hole. And that's what wrecks your returns. That's why it's, it's difficult. Compounding returns very, very much counts on never going below zero. You know, you don't want to have losing years. You can have less and then your average just comes down, but it's still going to grow. But once you start going backwards, that's a big problem with compounding strategies. But the main point is, you know, so, I mean, he's got $500. I, I said, look, just buy something that pays you a dividend for now. I said, all you can do is watch that grow. I said, don't play the market. Another mistake people make. Don't play the market. Get another job. Put all that money into the freaking bank and or into your trading account and buy stuff with that. Because really, it's just pointless. It's just to, to sit there and think that's going to solve your problems by putting this tiny amounts of money into the market. That's not the way it works. And I'll say it to anybody who's out there, like being a day trader or whatever, and 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 is it is in shape to work and could go out. If you could be going out and making a hundred thousand dollars, and you're not making at least two hundred thousand dollars in your broker account, then you should really just go out and make the hundred thousand dollars and let somebody else run your account. Whether, whether it's an ETF fund running your account or whether it's a financial guy or whether it's a hedge fund manager, depending on how much you have, if you're capable of making 10% of your investment, so in other words, even if you have a million dollars, if you could be out making 100000 on your own, shame on you for not doing that. That's, you know, it makes no sense. It's like you, you can make that money. You can go out and actually make it and put it into the bank and have more money that way. You don't need to only make money staring at screens. That's not the best way to make money. It's fine if you're good at it and, and you're making great money and you can live off that money comfortably, but you got to be able to have a whole strategy that lets you grow wealth over time. No one has any questions or comments. That's interesting. Okay. Ugh. So we talked all about that in Lowe's and Home Depot. And I talked about the AR at Wolfram Malfra. And so here I was talking about, and so yesterday we picked Macy's for, and I like I like Macy's so much at $15. I wanted to get it for the um the Hemboka portfolio and the um earnings portfolio, because their earnings are tomorrow. Tomorrow 21st, yeah, tomorrow. And the thing is, Macy's, if you look at their, um, oh, well, trust me, if you, if you look at Macy's, if you look at Macy's earnings over the long term, is this it? No. Where is it? I don't have it up. Anyway, all right. Take my word for it. Back here, they made $1.5 billion. Here, they're making $1 billion. So, but here your one point five billion dollars was met, was valued. Um, that's the P's. Your one point five billion dollars was valued at fifteen times earnings. Here, your one billion dollars is being valued at five times earnings. That's a huge difference, and that's crushed the price of stocks. So that's seventy eight percent lower. From 70 to, to 15, a 78% drop. I mean, that's crazy. You're treating them like they're bankrupt and they're making, uh, every month they make almost $100 million. That's not bankrupt. And they don't have huge outstanding debts and they've got a ton of uh, real estate assets. I don't, I just don't, it's just an out of favor sector, but that's what I'm saying there. There is a real valuation of something, okay? So to me, What's Macy's worth? Well, it's definitely worth 10% to me. They're making they're making 20% on their money. In other words, out of on a $5 billion company total valuation, they're, they're dropping a billion to the bottom line every year. That's a 20% return on, on money. 
that's what I want my business to make. If I'm going to buy a business, I want a business that makes 20%. I don't want a business that makes 5%, definitely not. I want a business that makes 10, 20%, 30%. But if I'm making 30%, I'm going to be worried it's going to get squeezed. And if I'm making uh, 10%, I'm worried that they don't, then they don't have enough margin to withstand a downturn. But 20%, that's, that's pretty good. That means they could weather a downturn and make a bit less money, or they could do better. And that's, that's where you kind of want to be valuation-wise. You want to have somebody who's going to actually be a business that makes you money. And that should be the primary consideration in these things. Because it is, it's no different. You know, when I buy a stock, it's not any different to me than if I'm buying the entire company. I want to see what they're going to make. Why am I buying this company? What am I going to make? What are they going to do for me? Are they going to grow? What are their prospects? What are their future plans? The same questions I ask somebody, if I want to buy the entire company, I want to ask those same questions when I just want to buy some stock in the company. Because the whole company has to succeed for the stock to succeed. Not, I mean, not 100% true because uh, the sentiment can change. And if the sentiment changes, the stock goes up whether earnings go up or not. And that's why I said, that's a good thing about this thing. There's two ways we can win on Macy's. We can win if they simply make more money. $1 billion is only being valued at $5 billion. $1 billion in, in cash is only being valued at $5 billion sales. So if they make $1.2 billion, that stock's going to go up to 6 bucks, even at this valuation. But... Even if they don't make more money, but the but the market decides that, that making that that a retail store making a billion dollars is worth a ten times valuation or an eight times valuation, then the stock's going to go up. Even eight is thirty three percent higher than it is now. Even if you move the valuation from five to eight, or that was sixty uh, percent higher actually. I mean, you, if it goes from five to eight, so. There's many ways you can win. Sentiment can change. The market can change. Macy's can do better, so on and so forth. All right? And if you lose, it's the same logic. It's like, did they go bankrupt? If they didn't go bankrupt, then what the hell is this price about? Even if something happens, like a recession or a bigger trade war with China, and it crimps their earnings, which, by the way, their earnings are crimped now because of the China trade war, because Macy's gets a lot of stuff from China, causing them a huge amount of problems this year. So... <clears throat> even with that headwind, they're only trading at five times earnings. It's just a dumb reason for a stock to be that low. So that's how I like to make my picks. I like to find things where, where I feel that they're being unfairly punished, where they can turn around and do a lot better. So we talked about the earnings portfolio. All these are good stocks, and they're all in good shape. Um, in the short-term portfolio... Oh, it went up. Look at that. Isn't that fun? What do we have? We we sold CBS puts because because now this is aggressive because it's lower than 40, but 40 is a silly number for CBS, so the thing had a logic. Let's see what uh oh, where did my computer go? Would I get rid of it? Oh well. Oh, I think I changed it for the compound rate calculator. Nope, oh, I don't know what I did. Oh well. What is this? Dividend.com. Nope. All right. Whatever. Um, I wasn't there. I was on the portfolio. Anyway. So CBS also trades very low multiples of earnings. <laughs> they're, they're trading in a multiple Tesla uh, and Netflix should have. Here's Tesla. Um Oh, ah, I forgot. We're supposed to sell calls. Oh, no, 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 no. They dropped. Oh, son of a bitch. I said that yesterday and I forgot. So it's time to sell Tesla short calls. Or did we do it? Oh, maybe we did. Hang on. I'm pretty sure. I, hopefully I said it officially. Aha, good. What timing. Holy crap. So we sold um, five of the December 365 calls for 
We brought back the short booking 2,000 calls to clear the slot. I, not that I, and I wrote here, not that I think it's going to go up. Yeah, here, booking, I'll show you. So these these booking calls here, we sold two. We sold, even we sold both. This is like a butterfly play. So we sold both of these guys. We sold the January 2,000 calls, and we sold the 1,800 puts. Now, the 2,000 calls have fallen to ten dollars means ten dollars sounds like a lot but they were 152 dollars so we've made 93 percent of our money and as much as i object you know morally to buying to spending ten dollars to buy that calls so that are two hundred dollars out of the money which is still ten percent and it only has a, a bit uh you know, it has two months let's say to go um it's not about that I'm worried it's gonna go over 2,000. And of course, if it goes over 2,000, then I'll of course make all my money on these guys also. It's not so much I worry about it going over 2,000 as I worry about, um, chart, chart, chart. So I'm not worried about this. It's that I think, I, I already did, I sold the 1,800 puts, I think 1,800 is gonna hold. So around here, I think it's going to find a floor and move back up. So if I have the 2,000 short calls, I, I can't, when it does move up, if it comes to 1,900 and fails, if it comes to 1,950 and fails, I might want to sell some more short calls. But if I'm stuck with these guys, then I can't do that. So I'm, I'm clearing the slot now of $10 short calls in hopes that I can sell $50 or $100 short calls when we have a bounce. Not necessarily at the same strike, but... I don't think we're going back. You know, now that we've had the adjustment, I don't think we're coming back over this blue line for a while. So I think 1950 is going to be safe. So I can sell lower calls and hopefully pick up like 50 bucks. But again, it's just a channel. There's nothing magic to what I'm doing here. We shorted that booking position on September 10th. And I, it may not have been as obvious at the time, but on September 10th, I said, this is ridiculous. And I said, you, I said, so of all the, the shorts I had been looking at, and I watched them, I watched Tesla, I watched Booking, I watched Netflix, these are my favorite shorts. And of all the shorts I looked at, this one was ridiculous. Oh, I remember why. Because on the same day, there was a news report saying um, that... Um, the tourist travel from China was way off or something in that, something in that nature. And I remembered from watching booking in the past, we used to play in there. This is the old price line. So I remember from playing in the past that a lot of their growth and business comes from Asia and China. And so I thought that can't be good for them. And they're trading at an all time high. And because it didn't directly, uh, wasn't directly aimed at their company, it was just a story about China travel. And you, you guys know all the reading I do, um, like like this. Let's see, <laughs> let's see if we can find. All this is me reading in the morning. Um, these are just the ones I keep. These are just the ones I think are worth sharing. Also, I read I read another two or three times that much of stuff that I think is garbage. And repeats. That's another. It's another thing. Sometimes, I, sometimes you'll see I post the same kind of article twice. I mean, I'll read the same article from five different authors because I just want to see what the everyone's little angle is on it. Sometimes you get a little more color on something. Um, not all the time, but if it's an important issue, I'll do it. So where were we? Oh yeah. So at the time, I said, well, I said for sure, you know, I uh, for sure twenty one hundred is stupid. So I said, and I and it's long term stupid. So therefore, we took the 2,100 puts, bought those, sold the 1,900 puts, and that was even that was net $17,000 on a $40,000 spread. But then I said, well, now that we have that position locked in, I said I'm also going to sell the January 2,000 calls because this is too stupid to stay to stand. And we sold the 1,800 puts. I said, well, okay, here's where I do think that the slide would stop. I think buyers are going to come in by that time. And if not, we roll it and we sell more short calls and it's no big deal. Um, this was 152 to 50. There was a huge ratio there. These are still 37. These things dropped to 10. That's why it worked out so well. 
And you know, and look, that's why we're up forty six percent. This one position is up thirty percent. But again, it's you, that's why you, in the short term portfolio, this is why you want to stay very much in cash, because in fact, <laughs> we have one hundred forty six thousand nine hundred dollar portfolio, and it's one hundred forty six thousand seven hundred dollars of cash. So it's all but two hundred dollars of cash, and that's again because we sell a lot of aggressive puts and calls in the portfolio. Um, so you know it's you you you've got to jump on the opportunity when you see it and that was just too easy that was just like you know i mean such an obvious reason to make that play um freeport just looking for the opportunity and that is we're looking for 10 it's at 11 so there you go then it's just a waiting game right it's on track so we just wait for it to come in the uh, marijuana etf in this particular case we picked it up at the right time we added 10 15 when it was lower um you are selling tremendous amounts of premium. Actually, not the right time. We're down a bit on the trade. Um, you're selling tremendous amount of premiums on this. And the mistake we made last year was not selling premium consistently. And now we're going to sell it consistently. And then we have uh, Philip Morris, which again, now uh, beat up over the vaping. I think that's I think that's a crisis passing. And again, news-driven reasons to buy stuff. And um, we figured that would take a bounce. And it's been doing pretty good so far. And again, very conservative targets, uh, 47 and 50, and it's really at 48, 50 already. And then TLT has been all over the place. We were much higher on TLT. That came down a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, not came down a lot, came back up a lot because it was at 135 and we were in credit. We were in great shape. Now it's at 140. But I think it's going to channel down over time and i think the position is long term it's uh, january so oh i see it's june on the short calls it's january on the put spread and we're, we're still in the money on the put spread so we're not showing a good payout yet but we will get to the to the good payout i believe and that's where we are so not too exciting i am gonna cut this thing off because i am losing my voice i hate to tell you but my, my throat's getting bad and i got a big meeting later so I don't want to be like, uh. <laughs> let's see if we have any questions though. Um, nope, no questions other than Eric says, supposedly, oh no, that's a, that's an old thing. He's just saying supposedly the US and China deal is what's killing the market. And it actually is coming back a bit. It's only, uh, we bounced off that. Let's see what we bounced off. We bounced off 3090, basically the whole, so basically 3100 is providing some support. Um, 2700, 27.7 support here. 8250, that was pretty obvious, right? That that was going to be support because we had this big consolidation over here last week. And uh, likewise over here, see, we've got that support here. We bounced right back off it again, 1585. So we'll see how reliable all these. And everybody bounced off their support. I mean, that would have been actually pretty easy to call if we were paying more attention. Gasoline had a huge run today. Uh, we got we got to the 165 target. We <clears throat> we wanted to get in. That's not the current contract, though. I don't think that's the current contract. We 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 had 158.50 was our entry, and we called out at 165 today when it got rejected the first time. And now we're back up, but that's a nice run. I mean, that's a really wonderful entry. And it's funny because I said the other day here, I said, um, I don't want to be greedy and jump in too soon because last time we went to 158.50 and that was where we wanted to get our entry. And now we actually hit it right on the button. So that worked out very nicely. Don't see anything else too exciting to play in the futures. Coffee had a nice move up. Um, the dollar is... Normalish. I mean, 97.80 is a little higher than it usually has been. Nothing, nothing big here. Nothing big going on any of these things. It's a shame about gasoline, though. I'd hoped uh, we'd have time to place a, a, a play on gasoline into it Thanksgiving, but I'm not going to play it from 165 up. I would have loved to have played it if it flattened. If it flattened out here, we could have played it. There, and when the market opened, it would have been great. This was this was early. This was three in the morning. Ugh. So unfortunately, did not cooperate, but next week's Thanksgiving, so that'll be exciting. We'll see what happens. All right, so that's that. We looked at that portfolio. We looked at the earnings portfolio. 
The hemp Boca portfolio is pretty simple, unless it doesn't work. Oh, here it comes. So that's down a bit, but it's down because this guy lost $9,000. That's the one thing killing us right there. And, um, and THC has been a winner, IMAX winner, and Molson Core is loser at the moment, but I like them long-term. I'm very confident in that for next year. So that's easy enough. We looked at short-term, we looked at hemp. And then the butterfly, the butterfly is too complicated to go over right now. We'll have to do a big thing on that when the month is uh, coming up because all the, there's nothing needs adjusting right now, but we will have to make a lot of adjustments in January. So we just want to sort of make sure we know where we are and what we're doing. And again, also being hurt by MJ. It's my fault. I liked it too much. I thought these marijuana companies weren't going to be so awful after the first year. I thought they'd I thought they'd have a rough patch and then get it back together. They're not really getting it back together yet. So we will see what actually happens here. We liked ACB, Aurora Cannabis, down. I liked them at three. They're <laughs> below three now, but I think this is I think they'll hold up here and come back up. And uh let's see is it CNA? I don't know if that was them. I can't remember my symbols. <laughs> CNA. Nope, that's not them. Canna. Can't think of what they are. Canopy. How do you spell canopy? Wanna? Can. Can C G C. That's what it is. C G C. Ooh, they're having a good day. Twenty percent. That's what. That's what tends to happen. They'll run, run down, and then. Somebody will step in and be a buyer again because they'll be like, okay, that price, I finally will be interested in being a long-term holder. And we'll see what happens in that industry also. All right, so like I said, my voice is falling apart rapidly, so I'm going to stop talking and hopefully get better by uh, five when I have my next meeting. And we will do this again. Oh, well, will we do it next week? I'm going to play that by ear. I'm not going to commit to next week because it's the day before Thanksgiving, and I'm not sure what the plans are, but um, I think I'll be here. So there's a 50-50 there's a chance at the moment that we're going to do a webinar next week. Anyway, thanks for coming to this one, and uh, take care. Have a good week.